as Chris said, my name is Christina Ishmael. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm thrilled to be able to join you all today. Uh, that improv activity, as I mentioned, great to do with learners, also great to do with, uh, with adults. Um, and I think it's really important that we set the stage. We need to celebrate failure, especially when we are talking about equity. And we're going to get it wrong, and then we're going to iterate and get it better. We're not going to get it right. We're going to get it better each time. It is an iterative process. So you are going to hear me talk about digital equity in particular and all of the things that we are doing in the Office of Ed Tech. But I hope that you see the thread, the connecting thread from what you heard um, from Dr. Sumner this morning and that you come along for the ride with me here. There we go. Before we get started, I would like to start with a, an official land acknowledgement. So in a pre-pandemic world, I had a chance to travel all over the world learning of the many indigenous peoples that inhabited the lands long before colonization. Today, it's more important than ever, especially as a federal government employee, to recognize these peoples as a very first step of acknowledgement and reconciliation. Today, we are gathered on the tra traditional lands of the Nipmuc and Agawam peoples. The Nipmuc spoke similar languages and shared similar cultures with Mohegans, Pequots, Narragansetts, I had to pause for a moment, and other tribes of New England, which used to be distinct tribes with their own leadership. Colonization, disease, and warfare killed many. Survivors merged together, and their tribal distinctions were lost. The Nipmuc tribe is not federally recognized, so there is no dedicated land or government for these peoples. But their people live on in parts of southern New England and as part of the greater Narragansett tribe. It is my goal as I travel to learn of the original stewards of the lands upon which I visit and share with you. So thank you for allowing me to pay respects to elders, both past and present. You heard Chris say my bio. And I have to tell you, I never dreamed of being here. I was an early childhood teacher. I taught preschool, I taught kindergarten, second grade, my ELs, you'll get to see some pictures of them. Never ever imagined being in policy, state level, federal level, no matter what else. But it didn't start there. My first degree is actually in business and mass communications. Arizona State, Sun Devil for life. I finished up in Phoenix, moved to Omaha, Nebraska, and went for my first private sector job. After I got into the car, I had a massive panic attack. My body was telling me I was in the wrong place. I was having a visceral reaction. I had always considered education. But I was like, no, I got to go in. I got to go into the private route. And my body told me otherwise. So then I pursued a post-baccalaureate program while I was teaching preschool, and then pursued early childhood and elementary education. And I'm so grateful for that path. Please see some of my original students here. Um, these are my English learners, or my emerging bilingual students that I uh, had the pleasure of working with in Omaha, Nebraska, which not a lot of people think, ELs in Nebraska? <laughs> Omaha Public Schools, it is the same size as BPS, as Boston Public Schools, 54,000 students, pre-K through 20, transition. Excuse me, pre-K through age of 20, uh, <laughs> transition. And they recognize 114 languages in Omaha, Nebraska. <laughs> so it was super important that we would come to the, the classroom and to our work with cultural competence and talking about the instructional materials that we were using to make sure that they were inclusive and representative of the kids we were serving. Then I had the amazing opportunity to move to the state level and become the state ed tech director for the state of Nebraska, worked with all 310,000 students, representing all 245 public school systems. One of seven states that does not recognize charters. We can talk about that later as well. Um, but recognizing a very strong public school system. And I had the pleasure of serving as that ed tech director for the entire state. Working internally to help my policymaker colleagues understand the importance of digital learning, ed tech, in 2013, 14, 15, long before a pandemic. And then being able to go out and lead professional learning. Or when a, f a friend, an instructional coach or a tech coach would call me and say, we have 30 kindergartners getting iPads tomorrow. Can you come help? <laughs> yes, I'm there. And I loved that job. In 2016, 
I have the most amazing opportunity to move out to Washington, D.C. to serve as a fellow in the Office of EdTech, leading Go Open. Um, I know some of you in this room know this. I see you guys. <laughs> um, supporting states and schools as I moved away from traditional textbooks to the use of open educational resources. Those are those resources that are available for free, without a copyright. You can revise, customize to your local context. We know that textbooks are written for the big states. Doesn't include Massachusetts. Doesn't include Nebraska. So when we customize it for that local context, it matters. It goes so much further. So I got to lead that program, and then I stayed out in DC because it kind of gets sucked in. Um, this was my first time at the White House. Yes, I did a jumping photo at the White House. <laughs> Do not judge. Um, and it was an incredible experience. In 2020, I got the call to be a part of the Biden-Harris transition team, uh, reviewing the Department of Education. And I was like, oh yeah, I forgot. I really like this mission-driven, purpose-filled work. OK. And so I was hoping for a position back in the administration. And then in October 2021, it happened. And now I get to lead in this office. But I will always, always say that I am a classroom teacher first. And that is incredibly important when we are talking about policy. There is a small group of us at the Department of Education, teachers at ed, that are former classroom teachers. So please know that we are representing you, every single one of you, as educators when we think about our policy at the federal level. We've had some pretty awesome experiences. That is the secretary and our assistant secretary at South by Southwest EDU last year. I get to fly back to DC today and then go on to Austin on Sunday, so I get to repeat the South by experience. Um, but you can see that I kind of like my job. Um, and I, I do carry each and every one of you with me. My hope today, these three things to take away. I really hope that you get to learn about our office. In fact, most people don't even know that we exist. Hi, we're here. I work for the federal government and I'm here to help you. <laughs> I hope that you see the priority areas in the work that we're doing in your own work. And then lastly, because we're talking about equity, but I'm going to turn it and we're going to focus a little more on digital equity, I hope that you also see, no matter the audience, no matter what age your learner may be, preschool, all the way through higher education, and adult education, that you also see that every single learner deserves digital equity and opportunity. I would not be here without my team. I'm really excited because I have two of my team members here today. So, Ellery, Michael, can you stand up, please? Give a little wave. We are a small and mighty team. You all probably have some small and mighty teams as well. But these are the folks that are representing educational technology at the federal level. If you would like to get to know us, we would like to get to know you. Our mission, because go figure, Congress in 1996 saw something that was going to happen around technology and education actually congressionally mandated the, uh, the office to exist. So we've been in existence since 1996. Bernadette Adams, our longest standing career staff member, actually joined the office at the beginning and is still there with us. So you can see our mission here, we're developing national ed tech policy to enable everywhere all the time learning because we know that learning does not just happen within the four walls of a classroom or of a building. We really know that because of the pandemic. But you will also see that last part as I just mentioned, kind of that spectrum of learners that we're working with. Early learners, K-12, higher education and adult education, because we have to think about that entire continuum of our learners. How do we do that? This is how we operationalize the mission. We are doing practical guidance and policies. Our, our main lighthouse publication that comes out of our office is the National Ed Tech Plan. If you know this, if you have ever heard of this, can you raise your hand? Okay, I see a good amount of hands. That makes me very happy. <laughs> we are actually in the process of updating that right now, so I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Strategic investments in design and development. We are not a grant-making office, which really stinks, because I would love to invest in teachers and ed tech developers and all of that, but that is not our role. We're developing the policy and the vehicles in which we can actually see some of those investments out in the field. And so we're looking at the strategic investments. When we get the money, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes, um, we then get to create these really cool challenges. And so our most recent challenge was a digital literacy accelerator. We brought 10 folks into a cohort 
that had either a curriculum, a, a program, a software, a tool, all about teaching digital literacy. And we coached them for a full year, gave them kind of their impetus to go out into the world and do great things with the digital literacy programs that they had. Another example would be our blockchain initiative. I know it's technology. I know the word blockchain can be scary. It's not. Um, but we did some certified credential work with several folks out in the field, learning about how blockchain technology can actually impact education. So for those of you that all have a teaching certificate, think about this. When you first graduated from your ed prep program, how did you get your certificate? How did you then share that information with Desi? When you got your first job, how did you then make sure that they had your certificate? One of the examples that we saw used for blockchain technology is that the, the learner themselves, or the adult, the new teacher, got to own their credentials, which is incredibly important. Secretary Cardona also, whenever he first stepped in to office, was saying, huh, the people that owe money at a university can't get their transcripts. You all know this? Yeah. So when we are applying technologies, new technologies like blockchain, where the learner has the agency and the ownership of their credentials, we don't have to worry about that. So we know that this is going to continue to develop over the next few years, and there is great potential there. So that is a great example of how we've been thinking about our strategic investments in design and development. And lastly, engagement and collective action. Internal engagement, we have a new report coming out next week that I'm really excited to tease out here. Um, and we get to provide professional learning to our colleagues and say, hey, do you know about the power of AI in education? Cool, let's talk about that. Whether it's a brown bag lunch series that we do or if we're doing an actual presentation and I'm briefing the secretary. That happened last month. It was awesome. <laughs> Collective action. We can also leverage my favorite word working in policy is called the bully pulpit. Um, so we get to leverage the administration, the office, all of those things and bring folks together to Washington, D.C. to advocate for education and more specifically educational technology. We know ed tech use has increased just a little bit. Um, before I show you these, these data that I move into, I have to preface, um, Dave's going to appreciate this because I also shared this with him at lunch. I always have to do like an asterisk before I introduce any of these things. I work for the federal government. I cannot endorse content, curriculum, tools, platforms. Uh, we are relying on Learn Platforms data here um, to be able to show a, a good overview of ed tech usage. I do not endorse them, but I have to start by saying that. This is important data to know. They started capturing their data in 2018. You can see at the beginning of the pandemic, you can see it kind of leveling out. Last year, 1,400 ed tech tools in a school district on average. Think about all those tools you're using. Now let's talk about, excuse me, the interactions you can see where the data is coming from, from their 2.9 million students. And then it breaks down by educators and students. 148 tools are being used on average by an educator in a year. 143 for a student. This is a kindergartner that we're asking to get on 143 apps or tools and a 12th grader. The tools are going to be different, sometimes the same if you think about Google Drive, Microsoft Suite, whatever it may be. But we're asking a lot for learners. And when we first went into emergency remote learning, because let's call it what it was, emergency remote learning, not best practice, we were worried about continuity of learning and keeping our kids safe. We were trying to figure out Google Classroom, and we were trying to figure out Canvas, and then we were trying to figure out Zoom, and then we were trying to figure out Team. We were going back and forth between all of these tools. You as the adults in the room were struggling I know that you know that your learners were as well. Imagine the cognitive load on a kindergartner trying to go through all of these tools and what it does to their families as well. Because <laughs> we know that it was not just, they were not the only ones that were doing that. In November 2021, President Biden signed the bipartisan infrastructure law. 
If you followed it at all, there were folks that were talking about the importance of railroads and um, bridges and all of these things as infrastructure. But what they didn't necessarily talk about was the actual connectivity and broadband, things under the ground that we don't see that are incredibly important as part of infrastructure. And for the first time ever, 2021, we have codified in law the definition of digital equity and digital inclusion. So we took advantage of that and said, this should be the way in which we work all of our projects within OET. So our entire mission and our priorities right now are focused around digital equity and opportunity because once we get the digital equity, no matter the age of the learner, kindergartner to senior, we get to the opportunities. We get to online banking. We get to being able to actively participate in a digital world. So, oh, it's really hard to see. Well, that makes me sad. I'll read it to you, don't worry. Uh, digital inclusion includes connectivity and devices. We did a really great job at the beginning of the pandemic, getting hotspots out, getting that emergency remote learning for connectivity um, to be able to keep the kids in school or, or continuing their learning. That is still a part of this work. And then we think about instructional models and content. We need access to digital content, plain and simple. When teachers walked out of their physical classrooms in March of 2020 and didn't have access to the instructional materials they were used to having, what did they do? They went online, started at Teachers Pay Teachers maybe. Not my favorite, but that's okay. Uh, started Google uh, with just basic Google searches. So we know that there needs to continue to be a push for access to high quality instructional materials that are also accessible for our kids and are based in universal design for learning principles. But we know that that often requires us to rethink the instructional models and the practice in the classroom as well. We cannot simply replicate. We've heard of the SAMR model before. We're not just substituting. Please do not give me a digital worksheet because I don't want it. So how are we thinking about new models, inquiry-based learning, project-based learning? How are we flipping the script where, where learners have more agency over their own learning? And then finally, digital literacy. This is not exclusive to our learners that are in classrooms right now either. In fact, the next slide I talk about families and communities. We know that digital literacy has to be a part of all of this because we gave devices out, we gave hotspots out. Did everyone know how to use them? No. Did we provide enough training? Probably not. Did we provide the training in multiple languages? No, nope, probably not that either. So we know the importance of that entire kind of ecosystem within digital inclusion. Then we move into learning ecosystems. Michael is actually working on our infrastructure guide right now. And when I first started to think about this priority, I was like, yeah, we have an infrastructure guide that we haven't touched since 2017. We've learned a few things in the past few years. We need to make sure that that's updated. And I was thinking boxes and wires, nerding out, interoperability, student data privacy, accessibility, all of these things. And when I presented this to Assistant Secretary Roberto Rodriguez, he said, great, where are the humans? So we had to go back and think about that. Learning ecosystems, yeah, where are the humans? Y'all are right here. We can't do this without you. Educators and educational leaders, how are we supporting them? We just launched a new program in June of 2022. Yeah, that was just last year. Um, working with educator prep programs. Because that's always the question too, it's the chicken or the egg. Well, we keep getting these teachers that are graduating, they're coming into our schools, and they don't know how to use technology either. Okay, great, let's go to the programs. We have over 70 institutions across the country that have signed on to a pledge, working to improve their programs with five principles. The first three are focused on the pre-service teachers, that they have access to the technology, they're seeing it modeled, they then get to practice using it. And then the last two principles are focused on the faculty. Because guess what? They also need to be using the technology. The one off ed tech class we took for our teacher certification is a start, but what about seeing it used in our reading methods courses or in our math methods courses? It's still not there. So we have 70, over 70 institutions that have signed on to this right now, and we realize the importance of educators and educational leaders. This was at a White House event, excuse me, White House. <laughs> this was at a Department of Education event um, last June where Deputy Secretary Cindy Martin um, joined us and these institutions to launch this, this program. 
And then of course, um, there at the bottom, we have our families and communities because we can't do this alone. We can't. And so they came alongside us during the pandemic and we need to make sure that we're coming alongside them now, that we've kind of returned to in-person learning. And I don't wanna say return to normal because that is my, not my favorite. Um, and we know that there were, we were at a disservice to a lot of students before that, so I don't necessarily wanna say return to that. But back in physical buildings, we want to make sure we're still involving families and communities, especially when it comes to digital literacy. And then finally, while we are certainly grounded in the practices of what we're seeing in schools right now, having conversations with folks like you to say, okay, what are you using? Tools, okay, that's really helpful. Okay, how are you thinking about universal design for learning? Okay, that was called out in the National Ed Tech Plan and in ESSA in 2015, okay, that's really helpful. That informs our policy, which is, again, very helpful. But we also have to keep our eye on the horizon what's coming. How many of you have used ChatGPT? How many of you thought it was really cool? Okay, good. <laughs> we shouldn't be afraid. It's a tool. I lead the Office of Ed Tech, and I love what she said. It is a tool. We are not going to replace teachers. The secretary agrees with me. So just know that. But it's really important for us to vision with ed tech companies and new developers to talk about responsible use in design. If we're talking about AI, where is the data coming from? How is it being formulated for that natural language response in ChatGPT? Are our kids being represented? We don't know. If we're having the conversations with them or we're talking about that responsible use in design, we have more opportunities to actually influence. It's not exclusive to AI by any means. It's AR, VR. It's other technologies like blockchain, working directly with educators to be able to make the product work. Have they asked you what you need or are they telling you what you need. It's that co-creation, which is incredibly important. And lastly, evidence. This is kind of that part where you're like, Ugh, I don't know if I really want to talk about the four tiers of evidence that ESSA calls out, but it's so important. We say evidence-based, evidence-driven, making these decisions, but a lot of folks don't understand the four levels of evidence that came out in ESSA in 2015. So one of our fellows is working on a project right now talking about the four levels, making it more accessible and digestible for everyone to understand how we make those selections around ed tech tools, around interventions, around curriculum, whatever the case may be. We know that we have a lot of work to do in that evidence space. Here are some of the priorities in practice. The National Ed Tech Plan, or NETP, current version is from 2017. We are in the process of revising this document right now with our uh, NETP team, CETA, State Ed Tech Directors Association. AJ is a member. AJ, thank you. Um, AJ is a member as your representative from DESE. I'm a former member um, whenever I was in Nebraska. Amanda is a representative from Maine. Uh, and then we have Learning Forward, Project Tomorrow, Innovate EDU, and Whiteboard Advisors that are helping in this process. There are workshops, ongoing listening sessions. I will be leading a session with Zach Chase next week at South by Southwest um, to get information from folks in the field to help inform this significant policy document. And the way that we're thinking about this, back in 2016 when this, the first, or excuse me, the latest version came out, we did a few changes so we can officially call it the 2017 version. Um, we first identified the digital divide. That, that's been there. You might call it the homework gap. That is what um, Chairwoman Rosenworcel from the FCC calls it and uses that as her language. But the digital divide, we know that there is a divide. We also called out the digital use divide in that NETP. So when you think about, um, as Dr. Sumner was saying this morning, like those fresh teachers that come out and they're in our classrooms, most cases when there are students of color, we are using technology in a passive way. It's not only exclusive to, to communities of color, let's be real. It is also used, quite frankly, in a lot of classrooms where we sit and let kids passively use technology or ed tech. Instead, we want them to actively be using and creating with these tools. And that's the difference. So that's that digital use divide. So when Zach Chase, one of our fellows who is working on this now, came back in, and he comes from an inquiry-based learning kind of background where he was teaching, and he loves questions. He loves those essential questions. So we have the digital divide. We have the digital use divide. What is missing in the middle? 
It is that professional learning, and it is learning how to design for the use of ed tech to enhance teaching and learning. We're missing it. And so that is where we're now looking at the digital design divide. Do you know about universal design for learning? Do you know about UDL? Do you know about accessibility, making sure that our, all of our students can access these materials? And so these are the three kind of areas that we're thinking about for this newest version. And so far the feedback's been very positive, but I would love to hear from you if you, uh, if you think otherwise. And our timeline for that, oops, sorry. Our timeline for that will be a release in early 2024. So hopefully, fingers crossed, that that all happens. The next part is, um, at the end of January, we released a new Dear Colleague letter. This is another kind of vehicle for policy that is not quite so capital P policy. Um, Dear Colleague letter is a letter to you as the educators, as the decision makers, to learn about the multiple funding streams to continue funding ed tech. And it's not just the devices and the tools. It's also the professional learning, because we also know that that's incredibly important. Um, so this talks about these four kind of things that we're thinking about. Professional development, student materials, resources, um, educator communication and collaboration, and devices and connectivity. You can use Title I, II, III, and 4A, IDEA Part B, to fund all of these things. It is a braiding of funds. It's just a fun phrase to say. It is thinking of how to spend down your current relief dollars, because we know that there's, that's still happening. Y'all still have some money out there. But it's also thinking about the sustainability, because this is the question that we get asked most often. The, the funding ends next year. I was in a meeting with Deputy Secretary Martin this week. Over half of the House did not want to give education the relief dollars. Over half of your representatives didn't want to provide support for public education during the pandemic. Spend the money. Please spend the money. If you need ideas, consult the Dear Colleague letter. There are plenty of other ways that you can use the money as well. But spend the dollars. In the 2017 version of the Dear Colleague letter, we got a, a lot of positive feedback. But it was like, cool, now what? Have you ever been in a, as part of a district that has to make that, that selection process, has to do the vetting? I heard that AJ was helping out state level over here, um, talking to Dave about this at lunch. It's a process. I was part of the review process in my last school district. We didn't have a process. I put together a Google form and then said, hey, teachers, you want an app? Cool, submit it on the Google form. Like, I, I don't know. And so the second part of this new Dear Colleague letter actually gives you some of those starting questions and conversations to have with your district. Hopefully, it is a team that is across the district, including general education teachers, special education teachers, your EL teachers, and then your district um, folks as well. And if you have them, please add your school librarians because we love them, we love them. They are fighting a big fight right now, and we need to include our school librarians in this as well. But it is really important to think about the questions to get started in this process. Do you have a needs assessment? We know that if we're using 1,400 tools, there's probably a lot of duplication. So what is it that teachers really need? What is it that the learners really need? What about your policy and infrastructure? Do they follow any sort of student data privacy rules? Hopefully. Do we know that? We should know that. The infrastructure, can we actually push this out on Chromebooks or does this have to be on an iOS device? These are all really important questions that we should be asking as part of this uh, as process. And then the instructional approach again. Are we rethinking what we're doing in the classroom or are we simply just substituting? Professional learning, it has to be ongoing. It has to be high quality embedding coaching, all of these pieces. Please do not set up your staff meetings to say, today we're learning about Google Docs. We know that that's not the best type of adult learning. We know that's not even good for, for students, much less. We need to think about the instructional practices and then which tools are gonna help us in that process. And that evidence piece again, I said, we're getting a resource that's coming out next month. 
if not next month, hopefully in May, <laughs> that will hopefully provide some additional support on the evidence side. The thing that everyone wants to talk about right now, artificial intelligence. Long before ChatGPT came out in November, we were actually having these conversations. And it started with a, um, a research convening that we held in 2020, right before the pandemic, brought folks in from the National Science Foundation, brought in researchers, brought in practitioners to say, where do we think this is going to go? It is not new, in case you didn't know that. Intelligent tutoring systems have been using AI since the 1970s. This is not new. Instead, it is just rapidly increasing at five times. It is so quick and so fast, we're not gonna be able to keep, a, keep up with it. So this is where we were kind of stepping in going, okay, can we help develop some guardrails and guidelines for developers as they're thinking about responsible use and design with their AI, make sure that educators are included in this process as well. So next Tuesday, <laughs> next Tuesday, we're going to release a brand new report on AI in the future of teaching and learning. And this will be the first document that comes from US Department of Education, let alone the administration, on AI in education. It's kind of a big deal. We are thinking about how AI can help in ed tech. It is not going to be continuing to use your ed tech in the same ways. But in these two things that we're thinking about and how we are also kind of defining AI within education, we want to move from just capturing data to detecting patterns in data. We also have to know the sources of these data as well. That's important, that transparency piece. And then from providing access to instructional resources to automating those decisions. We're not here to replace you, but can we reduce the burden? Can we reduce the cognitive load? If we have those metrics for our students, can it help suggest things for a whole group, small group, intervention? Wouldn't that be so great? Early childhood teaching, or our elementary folks in here, when you would do benchmarks for reading, you know, check, 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 omission, deletion, substitution, check, check, check. How many hours of instructional time did you lose trying to benchmark kids? I lost a lot. There are some new tools out there, I have to tell you, they're pretty slick. You put a learner on it and it does it for you using AI technology, it's using machine learning. Imagine the instructional time that you would have back not having to do that. Of course, we know that there are gonna be some risks. This is also part of the work that we're doing. We have to identify the risks that are coming along with these new technologies. And so it's important that we're having educators be a part of the conversation. These are the insights that you will see in this new report that's coming out on Tuesday. I have to read it because I still don't know all of these yet. AI enables new forms of interaction, helps educators address variability in student learning because everyone has learner variability. AI supports powerful forms of adaptivity, can enhance feedback loops, can support educators and then we know increases existing risks and introduces new risks yet to be considered, which is why we're having the conversation right now. It may feel like we're a little behind. We're actually kind of ahead, according to some policy folks. Look at what's in the middle there. As I said before, we are not here to replace teachers. It is a tool in our toolbox. The same goes for anything when we're talking about AI. We need to center learners and educators in the process. You'll see these pieces around it. We want humans in the loop. Or my favorite analogy that we are using, think of your robot vacuum. Do you run that? What about your electric bike? Maybe you don't have one, but you've seen one. The human has to be driving the electric bike. That is how we want to think about AI in education. We want it to be driven with hum humans in the loop. And then the last really big project that we've been working on is very specific to digital equity. And this was coming directly from the bipartisan infrastructure law that defined digital equity, digital inclusion. And so we like acronyms, Digital Equity Education Roundtables, or DEER, and put out a publication at the end of September last year that hopefully you all have a chance to take a look, but I'd love to give you a little bit of insight into it. This is what we did hosted a series of national conversations. 
we were in listening mode. We needed to hear from folks in the field. But we also needed to hear from community members, from parents and caregivers, from students themselves. We published the resource, and now we're trying to kind of get that community action going on. Here were the populations that we engaged. We identified five specific populations and held those listening sessions with them. Students of color, rural students, urban students, native and indigenous students, as well as our adult um, learners, with, uh, learners with disabilities as well, and justice involved learners. You may think, learners from urban areas? What do you mean? Uh, have you ever heard of digital redlining? That's a thing. That's something that we actually learned about in the pandemic because some folks on this side of the street in a very urban setting had access to internet and their neighbors across the street did not. That is urban redlining. LAUSD shared their maps of where they were able to see Comcast worked here in this block and then Verizon worked here, but there's this whole block right here where there's nothing. And so it's really important for us to think about those students in urban areas where we just assume that there is connectivity. I flew into Logan yesterday. I don't have a signal. <laughs> I know it's not exclusive to these rural areas. We think, oh, they're so unfortunate that they don't, have, they don't have connectivity. It happens in urban areas as well. We know that. So it's really important for us to work with these specific populations, learn how they are addressing it, and then how we could possibly put forward um, some resources around that. We identified the three A's, availability, affordability, and adoption. Availability, is it available? Like I just said, this street, the other side of the street, wasn't available. Do we have availability and do we have options? Or is it just one telco company? Or is it one internet service provider? So you can see the availability barriers, lack of reliable high-speed internet, digital redlining, building level barriers, if you have an old building, you can't necessarily put in your networking that needs to be in there. And then what are the strategies to address availability? Hotspots are great, but you still have to have a phone connection. So we know that there is still a lot of work to do as far as the availability. And that is also what the $65 billion investment with the Department of Commerce, the National Telecommunications and Information Act, and how we've been supporting them from the education side is targeted to do. Then you have the affordability. Internet is expensive. We all know that. I tried to go for the cheapest package and I couldn't get my teams to run on it in my new apartment. Let alone having children trying to access online classes and trying to do things online or a partner working. It's really challenging. So we also have to think about the affordability that comes with these types of packages. At the beginning of the pandemic, we were like, oh, these ISPs, they're saving us. They're offering all sorts of like, nice packages. And they came with some caps, data caps. Or if you had a previous um, balance with them that you hadn't paid, you couldn't get access. There were a lot of barriers even on that side of things. So high cost, lack of sustained funding. If you don't know this already, I would really encourage you to visit tech.ed.gov ACP. ACP is the Affordable Connectivity Program. It is a program run out of the FCC. There are 54 million households that qualify for ACP. Only 15 million are taking advantage of it right now. We need your help. If your students qualify for free and reduced price lunch, they qualify for this program. It is a stipend of 35, or excuse me, $30 every month that will help cover the cost of internet. That's it. They qualify for free and reduced price lunch. They qualify for Medicare, Medicaid. If the family qualifies for SNAP, all they have to do is sign up, and then they will get that $30 stipend. It will help cover the costs of many packages because the ISPs came alongside President Biden and said, OK, we'll provide these packages, 30 bucks. That is essentially free internet for the folks that need it most. Please help share that with your schools, with your families, whatever the case may be. And then lastly is the adoption. You already heard like these ISPs were offering the programs, but do we trust? Do we trust that this money is coming from the government? Not necessarily. We were talking with our native indigenous population and they said, I don't know if we really wanna do that. And so we had to really dig deep and say, okay, what are the adoption barriers here too? 
And you can see, it's exclusion. It's a distrust. It's a lack of collaboration. Non-inclusive communication. Not everyone speaks English. How are we making sure that this information gets to them? And then here are the strategies moving forward. Every single state in the United States, as well as all six territories, and almost 500 um, tribes, all applied for the digital equity estate planning grant, including Massachusetts. Right now, your state is working on a state digital equity plan. Are you involved? Do you know about it? Education has to force themselves at that table. Please work with DESE. Please work with your state broadband office. I'm happy to help provide more information and get you connected. But we need educator voices for the learners that they serve to be a part of that process. And so we're hoping that by leveraging the community-based organizations and these partnerships that we have cultivated over the past three years, or hopefully long before that, um, that we can get to a place where everyone has ubiquitous access. So here are the key steps for each one of us as we kind of move forward with our digital equity work. We have a lot to do to develop and earn public trust. As I said, I'm from the federal government and I'm here to help. Not everyone believes that, and that's okay. So now we have to prove it, and now we have to come alongside you and make sure that we're doing that. Learn from those impacted. Have the conversations. Have the conversations, Dr. Sumner. Go to the people that you serve. Have those conversations. What are the barriers they're facing? How are you going to apply some of these strategies? Co-develop with them. If you have a boys and girls club, if you have a local YMCA, how are they providing digital literacy trainings? Not just for learners, but for their families. Are they providing it in multiple languages? Leverage your public libraries because they're awesome. Because they're awesome. We need them to come alongside and help us figure this out. Raise public awareness. Please go back and spread the information about the Affordable Connectivity Program. It's my one ask. We need more households to sign up. And then provide that digital literacy training, as I mentioned. We know that we can't do this alone. We've got our state and local leaders. We've got our education systems, folks like you. We've got ed tech. We are asking for more money from foundations. Because we know even though it's $65 billion that's going in towards the actual infrastructure, putting fiber in the ground, whatever it may be, it's not enough. We've got more that it's going to need come. So how are the foundations and the venture capitalists thinking about helping con uh, contribute to this? And then our internet service providers, whether it is the big ones or like in rural Alma Center, Wisconsin, uh, where a dear friend of mine lives, and at the beginning of the pandemic, they discovered who didn't have connectivity and who did. And then they made a partnership with their local telecommunications um, office and they provided a $30 internet because it was covered under ACP to those that didn't have it. And now we're out of the, uh, I don't wanna say out of the pandemic like you were saying. Now we're back in person and we may not need it as much. And they're continuing to provide that to the learners in their community because that partnership was cultivated at a time of crisis. And it is a valuable partnership. I'm going back to the things that I hope you came to hear from this. It's a lot of information. My goal is always to kind of provide a window into the world of federal policy. Sometimes it's super nerdy. And sometimes you're like, yeah, that. Like, thanks, because that, that is what I do in my classroom. And that is so important as we carry on our work, especially with our colleagues. So I hope you were able to learn a little bit more about the Office of Ed Tech, our work, our priorities, but it's that last piece right there. That you believe learners, no matter where they are in life, deserve digital equity and opportunity. Thank you.